Lisa Piantonita. She's an accomplished public relations professional with more than 20 years experience with local, national, and international media. Please give a warm welcome to our facilitator, Lisa. As she just said, we're going to have a panel discussion, which definitely involves all of you. So as our panel of experts give us their thoughts and ideas as we start, I want you to be thinking about your personal experience and how you've engaged in social media and to be able to share those, um, that commentary as well as the questions. As I was getting ready for this um, conference, my three-year-old came up to me and he says, Mom, can I have a popsicle? And I looked at his face, and he had blue all over his face. Mm -hmm. And I said, have you had a popsicle? And he said, well, one. And I said, OK. And I started to press the questions. And I said, did you really just have one? Because there's a lot of blue. So maybe two. And uh, this conversation went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I couldn't rely on the observation that I had had and I couldn't rely on his personal account so I got up and I went over to the freezer and I pulled out the box of popsicles and there was one remaining in a box of six <laughs> maybe five so um, it was kind of an interesting scenario because I looked at him I knew I knew he had a popsicle I didn't know how many and and we had gone back and forth and he'd given me his input but until I had the data I actually didn't know what had occurred. And when we rely solely on individual input and personal observation to evaluate a situation, we don't always get all the facts. Data and evidence provide valuable information needed to make decisions based on facts. And in my case, once I had the data, he had five popsicles, it was very easy to make my next decision. No more popsicles. Um, well, the Diagnostic Center does data. It's a technical assistance resource provider, and we specialize in implementing evidence-based solutions. Each of you received a black folder in your packet, all about the Diagnostic Center, and I encourage you to read it. The Diagnostic Center works with local law enforcement to reduce violent crime and increase public safety. They help communities invest in what works, bridging the gap between data and justice policy. Today's panel, We'll discuss how police departments can leverage current research to invest in social media and address public safety issues. We have three experts on our panel, and they're going to share both the data and their personal experience with social media and law enforcement. So let me introduce them to you with a little bit about their backgrounds. Jessica, to my immediate left, is a diagnostic specialist with the Diagnostic Center. She has over 18 years experience in criminal justice and national security through her roles as a sworn police officer with local and federal law enforcement agencies, a university professor, and as an independent consultant. Jessica has led and supported DOJ trainings and technical assistance initiatives for over 50 police agencies, enhancing her organizational capacity to respond to critical issues and improve internal agency mechanisms to collect, process, and use data for operational efficiency. Amanda Lee Hughes is an assistant professor of computer science at Utah State University. Amanda is sitting in the middle. Professor Hughes grounds her work in the empirical analysis of social relationships and work practices, and after which she designs, prototypes, tests, and implements digital solutions that support this analysis. Her current work investigates the use of the information communication technology during crisis and mass emergencies with particular attention to how social media affect emergency response organizations. And finally, on the end, we have Lieutenant Todd Joyce. Lieutenant Joyce is a native of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and he's been with the Fayetteville Police Department for over 15 years. He began his career in the patrol division before transferring to the homicide unit and then to internal affairs. As a lieutenant, he is currently serving as the FPD's public information officer. He's responsible for the department's social media program. He and his colleagues have established innovative and new ideas that have helped FPD's social media presence grow significantly in a relatively short amount of time. So I look forward to hearing your input on this topic. 
and we want to follow this with a lot of discussion. Um, so as they engage, please be thinking and writing down your own questions, and we'll be calling on audience members for not only questions, but also your input and your experiences. With that, Jessica? Mm -hmm. and, and just to make sure everyone can hear. Can everyone hear? All right, excellent. Uh, so as Lisa said, the Diagnostic Center is a training and technical assistance program. Uh, when we work across the country with local and state uh, departments, we apply a three-phased approach. And I think much like uh, we've heard from counterparts this morning, the approach to uh, addressing some of the public safety issues is really about that collaboration and being able to, I think Miami said, break the mold. Uh, the uh, United Kingdom this morning uh, said uh, to do something different and kind of humanize uh, the badge as well. And so I, the Diagnostic Center looks at that three-phased approach of bringing in uh, people and subject matter experts from all over. So whether that's within criminal justice policy or academia, the community members and federal government. And um, to date we've, we've been able to, and have the privilege of working with over 60 agencies in that capacity and while these um, agencies as you can see from for those of you that can see the slides that it's all over the country and in different regions and with that it's different sizes and different issues that they um, might have asked the Diagnostic Center for assistance with. One of the themes that we continually see in dealing with agencies is a communication aspect of how are they communicating with their community members, how are they um, you know, reaching out to get the information that they need, whether that is from an investigative standpoint or um, just bridging that gap that they might have with their community, getting ahead of some of those issues. And we've, we've uh, of course, heard a lot about that this morning. And so um, myself, in the capacity of um, working with Fayetteville um, over the last few years, has given a lot of thought of how does this work with social media and the kind of quest that we're all on um, of, of using social media to our advantage rather than um, just kind of being victimized by social media with some of the negativity that can float around. And um, that's, it's really been a moving target. So as um, in my position with the Diagnostic Center of trying to bridge any potential gaps between research and practitioners, um, as well as kind of my personal uh, approach to that, I think it's a matter of timing. Um, timing of your public safety po policies and procedures and then the uh, timing of research. And so for those of you in the room that have ever had a partnership with an academic institution, you know that the timing of academia may um, not exist on the same timeline as, as your policing. And, but with that, um, even though there's some challenges there, um, you know, I think that, that it's also kind of important to understand that there's a, a value add for both, of the, um, both the immediacy of public safety um, but also the, the kind of um, timing of, of the research. And so um, in pre preparing for this uh, conference, I thought about, well, what does the, what does the criminal justice agencies um, have as part of their resources um, to educate themselves on uh, how they're supposed to use social media and uh, what their expectations are? And so obviously this organization is, is a large part of that education and training aspect, but um, the the academic side of me, um, <laughs> went back and said, well, who else is writing and researching about this? And uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, uh, or excuse me, the Bureau of Justice Statistics um, releases the law enforcement management and administrative statistics on a periodic basis. And, uh, you know, over the last 14 years, uh, it's only been once that they have asked about social uh, media and how uh, police departments are using it. And that was almost four years ago. And so that kind of put me onto this idea of, well, if, if we don't have national statistics or kind of a national understanding, then who is it that's kind of collecting those best practices or, or those best purposes? And it also let me think about, well, if that was 14, over the last 14 years, we've only thought about that once, and law, enf law enforcement has used social media to a great extent during that time, uh, you know, how, how are we capturing some of these stories? and some of, um, you know, being able to kind of measure our success. And so I think both myself and, and the two panelists with me today are gonna talk about those, some of those metrics and what some of those metrics might mean. So when we think about the uh, intentions and research areas, um, as you all have, have heard this morning, there's an investigative aspect that's really helpful 
there's a community outreach. You, you recognize what your community is responding to, whether it's that pink vehicle from Boston, um, Massachusetts this morning or um, you know, the, the social media 101 coming out of Miami. Uh, you, you know what your community is responding to and what they're looking to you for. And so thinking about that in a way of putting your strategies and your plans together. And a lot of the research um, you know, that, that we look like, and, and I, I'm going to forget who said it this morning, is that you really do have to break, break the mold and kind of go outside of the box. Uh, criminal justice research really focuses on that investigative or surveillance strategies. Uh, whereas your communications research really helps you with those goals and objectives and some of the things that you've heard this morning. And, and then there's this other side of emergency management, uh, which inherently becomes part of the law enforcement community because you are emergency responders and uh, being able to understand how to communicate in times of crisis and um, what, is, what are those interactions look like. And so those three areas, uh, you know, I, I think I continue to... Um, try to get people to wrap their heads around that it's not just one research area that's an answer or it's not just one expert or, or one subject matter person from one of those particular areas, um, but it's a combination of all of that um, because you need your criminal justice person who understands the surveillance or the investigation um, and you need your communication person to help you set those metrics and how to measure those and how to reach and how to do it in a very uh, personal and, and um, innovative way so that it catches everyone's attention. And, and then the emergency management aspect is just an inherent part of the job, right? That's the, you know, you, you are going to be the ones that are called when, um, you know, the, the traffic lanes shut down, when there's, uh, you know, some other type of natural uh, disaster or natural hazard that has happened in your community. And people are going to be looking to you as a means of resources, as a, a means of um, safety. And so being able to understand, you know, the best uh, ways to kind of think about that. And the research has looked at that in, in a very incident-based way. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Hughes to talk a little bit more about that emergency management research and uh, how that's used in public safety. Thank you. Um, so um, I just want to talk a little bit about myself because I'm, I'm a little different than anybody that's spoken so far because I'm, I'm an academic and so um, I have, I, I was very fortunate that I kind of fell in with this great professor at um, the University of Colorado in Boulder, that's where I did my PhD and I started that about 10 years ago and it was just, just when social media was really starting to kind of pick up and um, my professor kind of noticed that, you know, there was the, all these crazy things that were happening during emergencies and all these new behaviors that could be supported by the public and and um, does that emergency managers and such through social media. And so we started kind of this whole research agenda and we called it crisis informatics. And it was all about understanding how information was moving and how people were communicating and what kinds of behaviors social media was now enabling. Um, and so we started, um, we started this research. One of our very first studies was Virginia Tech shootings actually in 2007. And so we looked at those and we, we looked at all these different, um, we, at first we had no idea what to even expect because um, people had been talking about Facebook and, and um, half of us didn't even know what it was when we started looking at it. And we were, we were starting to just understand what, is, what are people using this, this technology for? And, and um, our, our study found that um, there was really interesting instances of what we call collective intelligence where um, all these members of the public were putting together lists of the victims of the event. And across all the different lists that we found through social media, we found that they actually composed a completely correct, not all the, not all the lists were um, complete, but they never listed somebody that hadn't been affected. Um, so there was no incorrect information. But together they had listed everybody who had been affected before the names were officially released the next day by the, the official responders. And um, to us that wasn't, uh, that was just a really, I think that's not surprising to anybody now because now we know that the, the members of the public will use social media to kind of gather information and figure things out on their own. But at the time this was extremely kind of innovative and really interesting um, behavior. And so this were, these were some of the things that we first started looking at. And then uh, 
as I started to figure out what I wanted to do, I started, um, we, had, we talked to a lot of PIOs in the, the Colorado, Denver area, and I started kind of talking with them and talking about their challenges and all the problems that they were having trying to use social media. Um, and that's what I, I love about, this conference is great because I feel like I'm like coming full circle because when I started this research, those PIOs, they were complaining about many of the things that you still complain about a little bit, but mostly things like how can we get our information technology department to actually let us use Facebook because it's blocked right now because our chief can't imagine any possible use beyond like personal use for these types of technologies. And so, um, so it's come a long ways and it's so exciting to actually see um, these agencies like doing really innovative and, and inventive creative things with social media. Um, so, so I kind of wanted to just summarize some of the research. I've done, I've done a considerable amount of research in the, around emergency management, so I, I also want to put that in context that I, I have looked at law enforcement, but usually that's not my focus. Usually it's a more general emergency management context, so sometimes that involves you know, all your emergency managers and, and fire departments and, and all the other various agencies that are involved in emergency response. But I think most of the findings really apply to um, police officers as well. Um, so, and then the other thing is that um, the, that uh, crisis is kind of, emergency events are kind of a whole new level of, of social media. And that's why we like to study them because um, you know, it's one thing to kind of daily monitor your social media messages and kind of respond on a one-on-one, you know, maybe you get four or five messages back, you send some messages, but you know, something like Hurricane Sandy happens and you get like 25 million messages, there's just no way that you can actually feasibly um, do, <laughs> you know, respond or even see all those types of messages. So, so those are the types of problems that we look at a lot in research is how can we start managing um, these crazy amounts of data. So, um, so on, the, on this page I was just talking about, uh, these are kind of the behaviors, that kind of what I consider the, the major uses of, so of social media during crisis events. Um, the first one is really information sharing, which is still extremely, um, we find that in our research that uh, that still tends to be the primary use of social media by emergency managers, even though we know that it can do this great social engagement and things, but often during an emergency, it's all about just getting that information out. Um, and com community engagement, definitely still a goal, but definitely still takes a lot of time to do, and sometimes you just can't do it during an emergency response. And the other problem is that um, usually during a crisis, if you haven't been engaged with your community beforehand, that's probably not the time that you're just gonna suddenly develop this amazing, amazing community rapport and start um, engaging with your community. So um, I think if community engagement is all about establishing that engagement during times when there isn't crisis, when you, we, you can communicate and establish those, that rapport. Um, there's a lot of research that's happened around situational awareness, so how can we take these, this information that, it, that the public are creating and uh, process it and kind of figure out how that can help us in our emergency response. Um, this is a really uh, active area of research, uh, but, but it's not perfect. It's extremely difficult to do. It uses a lot of advanced techniques and like machine, machine learning and um, natural language processing. Um, they're getting better and better at it, but um, it's still, it's certainly not something we can do real time. Most of the research that happens there happens where we gather a whole bunch of data around a particular event and then we sit and examine it for like years to come. Um, that's the, the talking about the scale, uh, the time scale for research is it, we, we are admittedly quite slow. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work very well with, uh, what, with if you want answers right away. Um, another kind of line of research especially around social media and crisis is looking at false rumor and misinformation. This is becoming more and more prevalent, especially with all the problems with like fake news in recent days. So um, there's a lot of research where people are trying to understand how can we weed out that information? Um, how, can we, how can we correct it? Um, there was a recent study that talked about how, um, that actually was able to empirically show that uh, if official sources of information, so this is like law enforcement or emergency managers, things are, are actively 
sending out corrected information that it really can kind of stop or, or kind of curb that flow of misinformation because people do um, tend to look at those sources as being more credible. So, next one. So I wanted to just kind of condense a few thoughts about social media. Um, so uh, that, that have kind of come out in different things. So like assuming that the social media is a partial solution to understanding and reaching the public, um, that sometimes uh, we, I find that, uh, especially if you start using social media, and, and I, I do the same thing, I start imagining that everybody is, is using social media and because I start communicating with people who are also using social media and we start getting into this kind of echo chamber of everybody's using social media. But um, it's important to remember that not everybody is using social media. This isn't a, a solution that's going to take away all your communication problems. Um, it still has to be kind of integrated with those more traditional types of ways. And, and this goes hand in hand with um, knowing, and we've already heard this message before today, knowing who your community is and how they're getting their information. Because um, certainly there's lots of people that use Twitter, but there's lots of people that don't use Twitter or, or, um, or they created an account like five years ago and haven't touched it since. So uh, that, that was uh, an interesting insight to me too, is that um, certainly there, the statistics and things on we, I've seen several studies, and I've, I've done a few myself, of trying to understand who is using social media, like in a particular population. So like around Hurricane Sandy, we looked at um, 840 different fire and police departments uh, that were within a 100-mile radius of the landfall. And we tried to determine if they had a Facebook account, if they had a Twitter account, and whether they had like a website. And I, I don't remember the, like, the specific stats, but it was something like, I think it was like 80% had a website and like 30 or 40% had um, Facebook and like like 10 or 15, it was percent had Twitter accounts. Um, but, and then, then, and then it was even lower if you considered the people who actually used those accounts. There was lots of ones that had like, you know, that first message, hey, we're on Twitter. And then that was like four years ago, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Um, being on Twitter and, and having an account isn't the same as actually using it. Um, the other thing, um, and I was glad to hear people talked about this earlier, is being aware of the potential biases in social media data. Um, this goes along with the metrics, and so we're gonna, they're gonna talk a lot more about metrics, but I think it's really important to not take metrics in isolation because they, they don't tell you the whole picture. So, like, take follower accounts, which are the number of followers, for example. Um, you know, that, that's one measure of how engaged your community is with you, but those numbers can be faked, <laughs> especially as soon as, um, it, you know, it's that funny thing that happens anytime you start measuring things. Um, I, I especially see this with my students in my classes, as soon as you start telling them, well, you're going to, this is what your grade is going to be based on, they get really, really good at, <laughs> at figuring out ways to make that grade higher. Um, same thing happens with Twitter. Like if you tell, if you decide that your definitive characteristic, your thing you're looking for is follower accounts, you, there are programs and things that you can do <laughs> to boost your follower account artificially. So it, it, it's um, important to kind of be strategic there also talking about like algorithms with, um, so Facebook, for example, a couple years ago, um, probably many of you are aware of this, but they changed the way that they view, uh, people could view your, your content. And so it used to be that you felt fairly confident that if somebody was a follower of your account that they would see your message, but, but because of the way they, they build their algorithms, and so the algorithm is just basically a method telling you uh, that determines how they're actually displaying data to their users. Um, because of that, you don't, you're not guaranteed that anymore. But if you don't understand that, you might be relying on Facebook as like this ultimate uh, form of communication that's reaching all your public, but it's not really doing that. And um, it's something to be extremely aware of because these companies are not, uh, you know, they have very different interests than we do. And so when they, they make changes all the time, even on like a daily basis, they sometimes will change or tweak different things to their platforms. And um, if, you, if you're not on top of that, you may not understand how it affects your communication strategies. Um, 
And then also just understanding the general expectations, the norms, the way that people use social media, because each different platform is different. And there's so many different platforms out there. So, um, so I wanted to just, we'll briefly go through this pretty quick, but um, so specifically we're kind of talking about trust and um, trust in particular is really hard to measure because uh, really the best way, the, the best way to measure trust would be to send out, um, to actually go to everybody in your jurisdiction or get a really good sample of people and just ask them all these questions about, did you get information from my social media account? Did you trust that information? And, and then there's all these questions about whether they would actually an honestly respond to you. And so trust is a very difficult thing to measure and, and, and to do it well, it's extremely expensive as well to go and talk to all these people and get, um, so, uh, we, we did a study a couple of years ago where this is all more theoretical, so it was more based on theories of trust and what people um, typically think of as building trust, and so we came up with several different recommendations, and so I'll just read through those pretty quickly. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory, but supplying timely and relevant information, um, serving as a local authority for information in your domain, um, citing others for, uh, for information outside your domain, um, report on your ongoing re response effort. So people want to know what you're doing and if you can show that you're actively working on things. Um, that was one of the problems in kind of the early days of social media is that uh, uh, people wanted information and they wanted it now where they used to have to kind of wait for it. They had to wait for that press release or something like before they would hear what was going on. Um, but so they would, if they weren't hearing anything over social media, they thought that their emergency responders weren't doing anything, that they were just kind of sitting around, um, you know, thinking about what to do next or something. Um, making yourself publicly visible online, um, correcting rumor and misinformation, uh, responding to requests from the public for information or help. This was kind of a new, I, I don't know where this kind of stands now, but um, there's still a lot of lack of policy around how you're supposed to respond. So what if somebody makes a request through Facebook or social or Twitter, how seriously should you take that? Um, and uh, invoking a sense of community with the public. We talked about earlier people talking about humanizing the responders, making, you know, that we're all in this together types of messages. Um, and then the last one was adapting official procedures to address public needs. And so there was a really interesting case in Hurricane Sandy. It was the Breezy, the Breezy Point neighborhood was um, flooded and it, it was like surrounded by fire. It was just like this horrible situation where there were people that were stuck and the emergency responders couldn't really get to them because of the flooding. And, and then um, dispatch was like completely overwhel overwhelmed. This was like a neighborhood in um, uh, New York. So uh, what, they, what happened is that people started making some requests through social media, through Twitter, because, because they, that w they could actually send some messages through that, but they couldn't get anybody through the phone. And so um, there was this person who was, and, and I could find the name if I needed to, but I, I don't remember her name off the top of my head, but she was the social media person. And she, ha she was started getting these requests and she was like, what am I supposed to do? Because our policy is not to respond to Twitter messages that we're not supposed to like send people, you know, that's not 911. And so she started out with this messaging of, this is not 911, please call 911, please call the dispatcher. But people kept coming back and saying, we can't, we can't get through. And so it was a really interesting case where she ended up having to s become this relay where she was relaying messages from Twitter for people that were stuck and trapped in buildings to um, the dispatch herself, like kind of through back channels. She was having to kind of go against policy, kind of adapt um, policy because um, the policy just hadn't been ever changed to address this type of situation. And then... So um, just to kind of close, so this summer I was part of a, a, a academic exercise where we were putting together recommendations for um, regarding emergency social media use for the FCC. Um, and so here were some of kind of the broader 
recommendations in terms of being strategic and flexible. And so one was uh, you know, determining the goal of your social media communication. Again, we heard this, t this earlier. Um, different goals you know, require different strategies, different types of social media. What are you trying to do with your social media, s your, your social media strategy? Um, educating your stakeholders about what types of information you are going to provide and where you are going to provide it. So I think that's also a very important part, especially as social media becomes more and more prolific as we get, as we start having four or five different channels. How do people know which channel is the one that they should be paying attention to based on what kinds of information they want to receive? Um, and then just having flexible social media policies that allow you to be more adaptable as new technologies become available um, and as, you know, a, a organization objectives and things change over time. So, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, the Diagnostic Center um, gets a lot of requests from agencies and um, I don't know that we've ever specifically had a request about social media or communication. I think, um, and Lieutenant, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think as I started to make some recommendations around that, I, I think I got a few funny looks from, from, from you all and the chief of like, what is she talking about? Uh, so in that um, black folder that you have in your package that gives you a little bit of background about the Diagnostic Center, there's also a one-pager about Fayetteville Police Department and their request to us. And um, you know, I'm not going to go through the full request because uh, really it came down to this, is that they, they asked us how can they connect with their community in a different way and um, with the intention and the main objective of lowering their crime, their violent crime, and specifically violent crime that was either juvenile or young adult offenders, as well as juvenile or young adult um, victims. And one of the things that kind of came out through a variety of conversations and work that we did with them was this communication aspect of, well, how, how is your community, how is your young community uh, talking with you, and how are they reaching out to you? And so um, probably no shock when we all thought about it is that the younger folks uh, want to communicate via social media. They're much better at communicating in 160 characters or less um, than they are having a conversation sometimes. Um, and so that's where it, it kind of started with us is that, w you know, we said, okay, Fayetteville, how, how do you use social media? Um, and what are you using? And, and I think, and you know, this was a few years back that there was a lot of, well, we have it, but you know, how do we use it? And how much, you know, how much are we supposed to post? And what are we supposed to post? And how do we brand it? And all of these questions. And so, um, you know, and then we looked at how other law enforcement in, in North Carolina were using it. Um, and, you know, and then we looked at the users, the followers of who they currently had, of how many people were living within the city uh, versus the county or surrounding areas and um, kind of through all of that and, and my research side of me as well as my kind of practical side is said okay well we have to do something a little bit differently and, and figure out a way to connect with your youth but probably more importantly are are your youth already engaging with you um, and so for those of you that can see the slides uh, there is um, some metrics that we put up here and for those of you obviously in the room are very familiar with Twitter analytics it's not just about those posts and those interactions, or excuse me, those impressions, um, but it's really being able to kind of measure those interactions. And so over the research timeline of the engagement as Fayetteville was moving on, um, I kind of took the liberty to, to look at um, their posts in such a way to figure out, well, this is what your community is really interacting you, with you on. Um, so it's not just knowing your audience, but knowing who's communicating with you on this particular platform um, and how, how to kind of categorize that. And so I'm not going to bore you with the details of how to do a content analysis of tw Twitter posts over a four-year period, um, <laughs> but uh, we're also uh, doing this again because, um, as you're going to hear from Lieutenant uh, Joyce here, um, they've completely revamped their, their social media strategy um, and, you know, the metrics from whether you're talking about followers or posts, but perhaps also um, some of those success stories. Um, and so before uh, Todd starts uh, singing the, the graces of Fayetteville's department uh, now, um, I just wanted to put a couple of things up here. Um, for those of you that can do uh, math really quickly, you can see from 2013 when they kind of started their, um, start, started their Twitter account, they were less than 100 posts within the entire year. 
um, and kind of consisted um, consistently uh, 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 over the next couple of years, kind of went around about a hundred posts um, throughout throughout the years. And um, and then obviously there was a huge difference when I looked at when there was just information being put out there versus that solicitation. And so I'm going to forget Butch engagement this morning. I talked about that kind of call to action and things. And so that pr produced a lot of conversations um, between the Diagnostic Center team and Fayetteville about you know, how, how to kind of balance that. You want to educate them, but then you also want them to engage with you and, and do certain things, um, you know, whether that's to help another community member, um, give you information for investigations, um, or just participate. And so um, that, that caused Fayetteville to rebrand completely. Um, and I will turn it over to Lieutenant Joyce to talk more about what that rebranding looked like. So I know I'm probably the only person from the South other than the Georgia Tech police chief and my friend Rob Tapano, but he's a transplant, so he doesn't count in Charlotte. So how y'all doing? <laughs> so when, when Jessica came in, we, we had a new police chief, uh, Chief Medlock. He came in in February of 2013, and he was very progressive. He actually came from Charlotte Mecklenburg, and very progressive in his, his thought process of, of inviting uh, DOJ in, uh, not only on the diagnostic end, but also to come in and review our pattern and practices. And people thought he was probably crazy that he had a horn growing out of his forehead. Then why would you invite DOJ to come in? And, and we've learned a lot about ourselves, we learned a lot about our com community and the relationship between our community now and in 2011, I worked in internal affairs, I know what it was like. And I don't want to go back to where we were six years ago, and I don't think anyone in our agency does either. But when we started working with Jessica, I was the sole person doing PIO. Um, I had been promoted lieutenant, uh, early 13, came back up after Chief Medlock had been there. We had a civilian in that capacity, but he wanted someone who was sworn uh, to move over into that role. And I did that for a year, and I don't know, is there anyone here who is just the sole person in your agency as the PIO? God bless you. I, I did it for a year. What hair I have left, I about pulled it out. Um, it, it was ugly. Um, you spend a lot of your day trying to get a, a lot of nuts and bolts, and, and then it would be in the evening time when you were able to take care of the business that you needed to. And as a result of that, like Jessica said, social media was hurting. It was lacking. You may get to it if you had time. If you didn't, I hate to say it, but it was, oh, well. And, and I think with, with Jessica's assistance and, and Matt, when when he came in from Tulane University, you started to see a, a bigger picture. And, and I was able to add another person in 2014, and we started to make those advances to where we needed to be. And, and then as Jessica Post showed to you that, you know, some of our tweets and things like that, when you look at the analytics of it, they, they were very small. And now when I look at it, you know, when we're posting probably 200 plus a month and, and you're starting to see impressions in the millions, you start to see that difference of where, where we were and where we've come, and, and that's the, the role that we have to stay. Um, you know, we had to, de to develop a new strategy in order to reach our community. One of the sessions when Jessica was there along with uh, Ron, uh, we were at a community event, and, and a guy in the back, uh, he, was a, he was a barber, and he stood up and he said, you're not engaging with the right folks. You're not engaging with young people. And so we ended up uh, going into high schools, and we, that, out of that grew the Chief Student Advisory Council, and we talked with them. Well, how, how do you connect with us? You know, they're not looking at Facebook. They may have an account, but they're looking at Snapchat. They're looking at Twitter. And so we had to start branding that. We had to uh, make those uh, new initiatives so that we could connect with a younger crowd. You know, I kind of look at Facebook. I'm sure it'll be along for a, a, around for a long time. But uh, it kind of goes back to, like, MySpace. It, at some point in time, I think Facebook will disappear. But that's, that's just an opinion. We'll see. Um, but it has been working really well. Um, you know, you had to create that consistent messaging uh, across uh, the board and in making sure that you're, you know, you're not devoting more to one than you are to the other, that you're remaining consistent across all of those lines. And we have a number of community events that, that started to, uh, to, to come as Chief Medlock was there. Um, in, in different sectors throughout our city and, and making sure that we were advertising and, and making sure that the uh, public was aware of each of those events so we had good attendance at that. We, we took a trip to Boston um, and, uh, and was it Roxborough? Roxbury. Roxbury. Um, and, and they had a great community engagement um, as to what they were able to do there and I think we adapted some of that as well 
and we're continuing to see those increases uh, to where you have uh, events that you know thousands of people are showing up to um, it's a good thing when you're having to run out to, to get more food or, or get more drinks because more people are coming they're engaged with us and it's not just that one event it, it's maintaining that uh, along the way um, you know we do look at those metrics I have two people now and I'm very thankful for that uh, I have uh, an officer and, and sergeant uh, Sean Strepe and officer Asia Cannon they're watching right now they they're they're the reason that ship has not sunk um, they're a lot younger than I am um, a lot of great ideas uh, that come out of those two and and what they have been able to do you know no one would have thought that putting hats on canines at Christmas and having a contest to you know which is your favorite canine you know it just it just it's crazy or, or a couple Mondays ago you know you know Nero wants to wish you a happy Monday and it's a dog in a box and he's, he's got his head poking out and People love it. People love dogs, um, you know, but I go back to October of last year when, when Hurricane Matthew hit our area, and forecasters had not predicted that we were going to see the rain that uh, was coming in. It looked like it was going to swing back out through the Atlantic. Unfortunately, it didn't, and we started to see uh, rain uh, come in our area pretty hard. We'd been hit the week before with rain, and we'd seen some localized flooding, so the ground was very saturated. So it wasn't very long on that Saturday when the rain started falling that uh, we seen a lot of flooding. So myself and, and, and my folks went in, and myself and Officer Cannon, uh, we have an MRAP uh, military vehicle. It was you know, acquired through the 1033 program, um, and we use it as a rescue vehicle, um, and that's what we call it. Uh, so you reduce that militarization of our profession. And we went out in that vehicle, and we knew that people had lost power. They... They couldn't watch television. Um, they may be able to listen to radio, but everyone still had a mobile device, and that's how they were going to start keeping up with information. And that was our goal when we set out that day to, to show folks the roads. You know, stay home, stay where you are if possible. If you need help, call 911 so we can get someone there to you. We had a lot of swift water rescue teams that were out and about, um, along with some other uh, agency partners that were coming in to help us out as a result of the storm. Uh, in one of those instances, we were, we were riding in uh, Officer Cannon. She happened to spot a lady who was standing um, barely on the, uh, the door of her car. And as we started backing this vehicle up, uh, the MRAP, if you know how big it is, the, the, waters was, uh, the water was up over the tires, which is a good four to five feet. And as we're backing up to this lady and the, and the hydraulic door open, she's holding a baby. And all I could think about was my two girls, who I knew were safe at home, and uh, she was filming this incident, and myself and, and the driver of that vehicle went out to, to get this child. And we had no idea what was going to, to happen with that video. But as we were preparing, we were on the cusp of, of, of reaching 50,000 likes on our Facebook page. And we'd been thinking days before, what are we going to do? You know, what type of promotion can we do for that 50,000th person who, who likes our page? You know, can we give them some type of prize pack or, or something? We were figuring, out that, figuring that out. We had no idea that we were going to blow past 50,000 that day, blow past 60,000 that weekend um, to where in, in about three days we had gained 12,000 new likes. And it was unreal to us um, because that video, you know, it went viral. It was about 5 million views in just a short amount of time. And, you know, when you're speaking with uh, Jim Cantrell from the Weather Channel, and it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. And um, folks from the UK, uh, we were we got con we were contacted by the BBC and, and doing radio interviews uh, about the impact of the storm in our area. But it just goes to prove how vital social media is. And those folks didn't didn't unfollow or, or didn't you know unlike the page. They continued to come back because the days after that event, we continued that process of letting folks know of, of all the roads that were washed out. You know where you could go to to get resources if you needed to get to a shelter through the Red Cross. And that was, uh, it was very good for us to, to, to be able to have that, that vessel of communication to, to get to our citizens. And it also happened in neighboring communities. And we started to see in folks, you know, I'm stuck on I-95. How, how do I get um, through Cumberland County? How do I get through Robeson County? And while it wasn't in our jurisdiction, we were making sure that we were giving these folks every a bit of information that we could to help them because they had reached out to us because they had no one else to get to. Um, so it, it worked really well for us in that, in that aspect. Um, we had an officer-involved shooting back in, in December, and we had had not had a, 
officer involved shooting for about uh, a period of 20 months and the last one before that an officer was shot uh, thankfully he survived um, but our relationship with the community and, and you, you hear a lot about community engagement and when our chief left there were some folks who who thought well maybe we can get back to being the real police now because of how he progressive he was and I was like it's, it's not going back to be the real police can you tell me what being the real police is because I'm kind of enjoying the direction <laughs> that we in, went into and that's a, that's a shift across the entire um, profession. So w we begin to work on those things and, and, and have those relationships that, that were non-existent before. And when we had the officer-involved shooting back in December, a um, man had, had killed his girlfriend and her children jumped out of a window and the um, car went to a neighbor's house. And officers responded, not knowing if she is deceased or not. And when they made entry into the house, um, they engaged him and uh, he had knives that uh, he was swinging at the officers. And unfortunately, they had to use deadly force, and, and he was killed. You know, thank goodness for body cams. But as we did our press conference that night, and we have an interim chief right now who, who we hope becomes the permanent chief, but at, we, we held our press conference, and it wasn't long after that, media didn't have any questions. You know, they kind of packed up and they left. We did a second press conference the next day to identify the officers who had been involved in the uh, shooting. And they left, and, and we didn't have anything else after that. And unfortunately, we had a barricaded subject just a few weeks ago, and the same thing happened, and people started to see, you know, from a command staff and an officer level that after the shooting had occurred, you give your statement, and again, it's transparency, transparency, transparency. If you're not doing it, you're going to end up like an agency that you've seen in the past that you don't want to be a part of. And the media packed up and they were gone. And everybody's like, well, where did they go? Are they not going to stick around for sound or, or anything else? Nope. They, they got what they needed and they left. And those type of things where you have to tell your story first, because if you don't, someone else will. Uh, I'm a big, big advocate of that. Facebook Live was, was a game changer for us. Um, and being able to get those videos out there in, in times of, of urgency, uh, times when it's a, a public cry for help, uh, or just some of the, you know, being, being humorous, uh, like, like our folks from, from Miami said, you, you have to humanize our profession because sometimes some folks demonize it, and, and you have to show that we're real people and that we like to have a good time as well. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll close. We had two missing children uh, this, this coming Friday. It'll be two weeks ago. A uh, father had his two children. Uh, one was two years old. The other was four days old. And um, there was an incident, a domestic incident between he and the wife. She was at the hospital. And when she got out, he had said he had dropped them off at one location, and they weren't there. So they're trying to go door to door to find these children. And as some hours passed, it became alarming of, of some of his comments. And, and later that evening, we made a cry out to the public, you know, for the safe return of these children, because you're talking about a four, four day old child. And um, unfortunately, I mean, the, the post and the video, you know, garnered hundreds of thousands of likes and, and views, but those children were found deceased. But it, again, it goes to show when, when it's children or, or, or other things of an emergency, our community is staying engaged with us, and we want to continue to see that. Um, you know, one of the unfortunate things that has occurred over time is that we get tagged because there's more than one Fayetteville Police Department. There's one in Georgia. There's one in Arkansas. There's a Fayetteville everywhere. But uh, when you hit at Fayetteville PD, we're the first ones who come up. And uh, I think that's, I look at it as a good thing, but a bad thing, um, that uh, maybe we're getting more hits in that respect. Um, but we're, you know, sometimes it takes a while to get these folks to say, hey, I didn't tackle the football player in, in Oklahoma or anything like that. <laughs> so you don't get that negative light upon you. But, uh, you know, it really goes to, to show of, of starting that relationship with the Diagnostic Center and looking at how we do things uh, to make ourselves better and, and just here to, to share our experiences so um, that we can reach out to one another and, and, and make each agency better. Thanks. So because Chief Metlock reached out to the Diagnostic Center, a conversation was started and um, Lieutenant Joyce referenced how they went on almost a field trip to another department to see how they were doing things a certain way um, and learn from that. And that's an opportunity the Diagnostic Center provides and presents itself if it makes sense with your customized support, um, if that's of interest. So this is a discussion we have about, oh, 15 minutes left. 
before we get to wrap up and we want to hear what your experiences have been with social media in a database way. Have you seen numbers? Have you seen results that you want to share? Or do you have questions for our panel? And I think there's a microphone going around. Yep, there's a microphone going around. Um, so if you have a question or a comment that you want to share about your department, please raise your hand. Some of you have got to have done some impressive stuff. Over here. Great, thanks. from Canada uh, agency. Um, in regards to uh, <coughs> connecting with uh, students, school age kids, uh, what are some of the advice to give in regards to what social media platform? I know Instagram's a big one, but <coughs> I've also heard like different things like Kick and all these other stuff. So based on your recommendation, what's the biggest thing that you guys see right now that's most beneficial? <laughs> Yeah, um, so unfortunately, right, with the technology um, evolution, it's, it's been a kind of light speed and, and what kind of comes around and, and, and how, how long does it stick, right? So Facebook and Twitter have been probably the most consistent, although the audience that it appeals to is different. Um, I think, you know, those, because they've been around the longest, those are the first ones to think <coughs> of. Um, for the, some of the smaller ones, uh, you know, that people are using, whether it's Instagram from the photos or Snapchat or things of that nature, um, I, I think the probably most important aspect is, is um, you know, what Lieutenant said of, right, going into the schools and asking them, what do you guys use? What do you, you know, like, what are you using to communicate? With your, you know, with your peers yourselves, but also, you know, how are you finding information? Uh, they are not getting the newspaper, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they are not watching the five o'clock news stories, and so, um, you know, especially from uh, what's, you know, platforms that are, are you know, more prevalent in, in other countries. Um, I think that's the first place to start is to kind of see where that is. Um, most of your kind of third-party analytics, when you look at different news stories, it'll give you the kind of impression across social media, and it'll kind of give, give you a gauge of, you know, this, this particular topic is more important on Instagram than it is on Facebook. Um, but otherwise, I think it's, um, you know, a asking the young people in your community of, you know, are you calling Crime Stoppers? Are you calling our, our police station? Or are you expecting to do it on a private message? Because that's, what, that's your comfort comfortable communication. And Chief Matlock would say, and probably I would guess you would echo, he would say all of this is a complement to um, whatever work is going on, that there's no communication source that should not be utilized. And social media is one aspect of it and a very important aspect of it. Um, but there's no mistaking a human handshake and a personal interaction. Yeah. Other comments or questions that have worked for you all in social media? Right, we get your time back, it looks like. I want to thank the panel for their time and um, your expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.